I would like you to join me in welcoming Emmy-winning TV journalist and personality and creator and host of the YouTube channel Lives. Please join me in welcoming Meredith Vera. When I first told my friends, my closest friends, that I was starting a YouTube channel, they were, what? You could barely turn on the computer. I said, yeah, I know, but I, I'm smart enough to have figured out that through a channel like this, we can connect so many women of all generations, all colors, sizes, and shapes to share stories. If I've learned anything from all the jobs that I've held, it's the need that we have to connect with one another and how important that is. And that's what I hope to do with this channel, give women a, a sense of community, a place where they can go to learn about what other women have dealt with in their lives, to share their stories, and hopefully leave um, feeling more empowered and connected to this world of ours. The whole point of this channel is to connect as women, and when women connect as a group, when I have my girlfriends over, we spend a lot of time talking about serious issues, but we also laugh a lot. Lives is a place where women can gather together and share their stories. Subscribe now. I'll share mine if you share yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, you know, I mentioned, I think, in that tape that I know very little about the digital world. I'm still learning, so bear with me. I'd like to pick all your brains if I had the opportunity. I am thrilled to be here with you and grateful to Digitas for giving me the opportunity to be part of their new front. New front. If you'd asked me a year ago, I wouldn't even know what a new front was, quite honestly. I'm still learning, as I said, to post on Facebook. And actually, when I started tweeting, people were writing back saying that I was drunk because I kept hitting the send thing by mistake. So I'm just still <laughs> getting better at that. Of course, several times I was drunk, but that's not even the point. <laughs> Although I am new to digital and still trying to figure it all out, I can tell you what most excites me about launching my own digital channel lives. It is the ability to reach so many people and to plant the seeds of a conversation with a single video and then watch that conversation bloom and continue to grow in social media. The impact can be staggering as we come together as a digital community. The question is, how do you get your message out and keep your audience coming back for more? On Lives, we have found that video can spark so many emotions and opinions, often, often helping us to find inspiration, to solve problems, or even have a good laugh. A digital conversation allows us all to take risks, to poke around at the issues and provoke further conversation. To be fearless, as we say here, as we get to the heart of issues that are important to us. To all the brands with us today looking for the best ways to get their messages out, I just want to say that I am right there with you all. We are all content creators looking for ways to connect and resonate with our audiences. So I am pleased to welcome to the stage a woman who is the epitome of a fearless business leader, someone who made a big, bold choice for her company last year. Please welcome Helena Folks. She's executive, here she comes, executive vice president of CVS Caremark and president of CVS Pharmacy. Hey, Helena. Hi, Meredith. So Thank nice you. to see you. Hi, everyone. First of all, Helena and I both grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. We both went to Lincoln School, Quaker School for girls. Mm -hmm. That was all about Empower. empowering. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all about empowering women. And you sure took the message and ran with it. Thank you. You've done a fabulous job at CVS. And we want to talk about this big, bold decision that you made to get rid of all tobacco products at all CVSs across the country. But before we, we delve into that, tell us a little bit about CVS Caremark. Sure, yeah. CVS is about a 50-year-old company. When I started with the company 22 years ago, it was a regional pharmacy chain in the Northeast, and it's become a Fortune 13 company. We'll do about $125 billion in sales this year, and we've got 7,600 pharmacy stores all over the country. We have a PBM, Pharmacy Benefits Manager, that has 60 million members as part of it, and we're the biggest retail healthcare clinic with Minute Clinic, so it's a really interesting company that's evolved from being a pharmacy only company to a healthcare company. And when you say a healthcare company, what exactly do you mean? Well, increasingly as more and more consumers are being forced to be on the front line of caring for themselves, we find that they're seeing doctors maybe one or two times a year, but they're walking into the pharmacy several times a month. And a pharmacist is someone they can trust, and there's a lot we can do for them to keep them healthy and out of the hospital. 
Speaking of keeping them healthy, there was a decision made. Did you start initiate this decision to remove all tobacco products? I was part of a great team that worked on this, and we've been thinking about it for a while and working very hard on it. But that's $2 billion in revenue a year, a year. that you made off of tobacco products. So I, I want to take us into that first meeting where you said, let's get rid of this. Yeah. So this was not easy. If it had been easy, we would have done it a, few, a while ago. Uh, what, what we found is we were having a lot of meetings, sometimes inside the company, sometimes outside, and we would position ourselves just like I just did. We're a growing healthcare company, all that we're doing to help people stay healthy. And inevitably, someone would raise his or her hand, that fearless soul in the audience, and that person would say, so how can you sell cigarettes if you're a healthcare company? And it was becoming, quite honestly, more and more uncomfortable. And then we really found as the B2B side of our business was evolving and we were getting more health plan partners, hospital partners, it just felt very inconsistent. So we got to the point where we knew it was the right thing to do. And then the challenge as a leadership team is how do you manage the transition? We're a public company, we've got shareholders to take care of. And so we worked very hard to, to launch this in February. And I would imagine some of them were not for the idea because it's a lot of money that's going away. We were worried about shareholder response. If you had asked me a week before the launch if I thought our stock price would be up a week after the launch, I would have said no way. And in fact, it was. And I think that's in many ways because shareholders and people cover our stock said, you know what? This is becoming a healthcare company. CVS really means it. And they put their money where their mouth is. So there was no negative backlash? Well, I'm not saying everyone agreed with it, <laughs> but, but certainly I think that people understood that if we're going to continue to grow and build our reputation as a healthcare partner, this was consistent. And for us, it was also grounded in what's the right thing to do. We know that 480,000 people die a year from smoking-related disease. And it was very, you know, it was very consistent with our core values mm -hmm. to think about how to do something there. I think the thing that we really underestimated was that everyone has a story. I'm sure all of you sitting in this room, you're touched somehow by someone, a family member, a friend, who's suffered the, the consequences of it. And so I think in many ways, this announcement unleashed a real emotional feeling about CVS. And usually we don't have emotional feelings about companies. So that was, that was a very powerful, it was a great example of doing something bold and a little bit scary and finding out on the other side that it can turn into much more of a positive than we thought. You know, we're streaming this right now on Lives, this conversation, yeah. because we like to talk about healthcare issues a lot. How have you used social media and digital to get your message out and to push it forward? Well, this, this announcement was a great example of it because it started with having a very simple, clear, concise message. And we worked hours on that. You know, how do we really get it right? And then we used digital to make sure we could amplify the message. And I think that came to life in three ways. Uh, first is we had our own website, CVS Quits, so it became a very easy place for a lot of people in the media to come and use the assets we had created. Secondly, we really created a lot of content and, and ability for our own 200,000 colleagues to hold on to and, share, and share this information with their friends and family. And I, have to, I said before, our colleagues are just so proud of what we did. And then the third thing we did is we made the content really easy to share on places like Facebook and Twitter. So we had Michelle Obama, Bill Gates, Mayor Bloomberg, lots of other people tweeting and retweeting on our behalf. So all those things really were a great example of how digital can amplify a good message. So how many people do you reach, do you think, when you use social media? Well, we found in that first week, between everything we did, we reached 215 million people uh, across all of these platforms. I mean, you know, my daughter's in college, and she called me up that night, and, you know. She doesn't necessarily think what I do is incredibly cool. And she said, <laughs> Mom, you're the number one trending topic on Facebook. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's, I've arrived. That's You've a made good it. Example. Oh, my gosh. You absolutely <laughs> have, yeah. A lot of what CVS promotes is, is customers taking control of their own health care. Yeah. That's very important in this day and age. How do you promote that digitally? Yes, so we are investing a lot in, in our digital content because I always talk about the mom who's the chief human resource officer of her family. So typically our core customer is a 50-year-old woman who's working, she has children she's taking care of, 
um, a husband often, parents, and she's, her life is complicated. And so what we're trying to do for her is make it really easy to manage her health care because health care is so complicated. There's terminology none of us understands. And even in the world of pharmacy today, th this, uh, this woman that is the chief health resource officer of her family will often have to go to her drugstore website to manage certain drugs and her PBM's website for others. And it's really a lot of navigation she has to do. So we're bringing this all together for her to make it as simple as possible. And I have four children, so I know what it's like to try to manage a lot of things in my life. And so part of it is how do we make some things really simple and how do we give her the tools to manage so that she can save time but also save money. And we know that, especially in this economy, it's a big deal for people. Increasingly, they're bearing more and more of the cost of health care with high deductible health plans. So these women want to make smart choices. So we can give them a lot of digital tools to help them make those smart choices. Are you taking it to the next step? First, you took the tobacco products and removed them from the shelves. Are you taking the next step forward to help people who, who are smoking to stop? Yes, great question. So one of the things we know is that seven out of 10 people who smoke today want to quit. And typically it takes seven to nine tries to, to really be successful. So we'll be launching later this fall what we think will be the largest smoking cessation program ever launched in this country. And we really want to use all of our assets, our 7,600 stores, our 26,000 pharmacists, we have 5,000 minute clinic nurse practitioners and digital to really help these people and do it in a way that works for them. So people can come to CVS and get what they need to help stop smoking? They can and they can get counseling. Um, so we have 800 minute clinics today and part of what we'll be providing to our customers is an opportunity to have a conversation with a nurse practitioner because often what we know it's both products but also advice and counseling that really gets people over the hurdle. So we'll be using our nurse practitioners and our pharmacists to engage people. When, when our pharmacists are filling prescriptions, we know that for certain chronic conditions like diabetes or heart disease, one of the worst things we, you know, our patients can do is smoke. So pharmacists are really trusted, and the idea is how do we leverage that trusted relationship and use the pharmacist to engage those patients in a way that's meaningful for them. So we're really looking forward to that. Fabulous. What would you say to somebody in, in business like you who, who wants to go forward with a big, bold idea and is a little nervous? What advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I, there were, often when I talk about this decision, there are four leadership principles that I share with people. The first of them is go big or go home. I mean, I've always thought if you're going to do something, you might as well do it in a big way and really, really make it meaningful. Uh, the second one is plan for great. So this whole plan thing. Plan for great. Yeah, I mean, this whole thing, when I mentioned 215 million people viewing it in the first week, this thing happened successfully because we had a team of people who planned for great. They did a lot of detailed work, including all the digital. Uh, the third, I think, is really important. It's be a marathoner. And this is this idea of, uh, and I love to run, and part of, I think, what the beauty of running is, what you find is it's hard. You know, it's, you have to have sort of grit and determination to do a hard thing well. And this decision's a good example of it. We didn't make the decision overnight. We'd been talking about it and working on it for a while. So if you're working on something that's really hard, don't give up when you hit a hurdle, because we all hit those hurdles wherever we are. And then the fourth lesson is really around doing things from a purpose-driven perspective. Our purpose is helping people on their path to better health. And this decision was very much grounded in our purpose. And as a result, I think we've created an even stronger connection with the customers we serve and with our own colleagues. People have an incredible sense of pride right now. Well, you're in working you're for truly CBS. being uh, true to your brand. We are being true. You know, yeah, putting your money where your mouth is, yeah. for sure. Were there any hurdles that you can Remember when you started this that you had to go around? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that we really had to figure out was uh, we, we talked about shareholders before. How would shareholders react? How do we uh, share this message in a way that they'll understand? What's the right timing for us to do this? So you can imagine the number of people who were involved in all of that. I have to say uh, there were a lot of people that made this all work. Uh, but our board played a very important role. They were really fearless on our behalf. 
Our CEO is the ultimate example of being fearless. And our CFO, because often people think that a CFO would never want to do something that gives up $2 billion in sales. But in fact, our CFO said, let's go do this because it is true to our purpose, and let's treat it like it's the biggest marketing campaign we ever did. But all of those things, working with all those different groups, allowed us to get through the hurdles, and we really came together as a team. I think oftentimes when you're working on something that's really hard, you find you come together as a team and do things that are even better than you expected you could. We have a couple of minutes before we have to leave the stage. Is there anybody that'd like to ask Kalina a specific question? You just stand up. Nobody has a question? I must have answered all Oh, there's somebody right, great. Hi. Right. So the question is, have we tracked the increase in smoking cessation products? And uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you that I think smoking cessation products will make up for the $2 billion in sales. <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, so one of the things that we've been very clear with our shareholders about is that uh, we've articulated to them what the hit will be this year. But we do think that over the next couple of years, the value to our company will be when we stand in front of a hospital chain executive or a health plan executive and we say, you have a choice between working with us and one of our competitors who's still selling cigarettes, who really is an extension of you as a healthcare provider? And so oh, in the end, I think that will be the true measure of success. Certainly later this fall, when we launch the smoking cessation program, we'll be looking very hard at the number of people that we can engage. And we hope that we'll be successful because Again, given that people try seven to nine times, I, I talk to people who've quit, and they say it is the hardest thing they have ever done. And so if we can be a meaningful partner for them, that would make me very proud. Yeah, I, I tried many times to quit, and uh, finally did when I was pregnant with my son, first son, and yeah. then the minute he was born, I wanted yeah. a cigarette. Literally, I didn't even want to look at him, just give me a cigarette. <laughs> I didn't have it, um, as it turned out, because I know I would have been hooked again. It's, it's hard. It's very, very hard. Yeah. And if I ever reach the age of 80, I might smoke again. Then I'll come to your <laughs> and say, People say that, right. Say, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so yeah, much. Thanks, Such Meredith. a pleasure. I appreciate thank it. you, Lynn. Okay. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>